Jason Kim with Ian Hamish, and it's lovely for everybody to be here who's tuning in. Thank you. What's up, guys? Yeah, man. Thanks to everybody tuning in via the Instagram. Um, remember, you can catch up on YouTube later and watch what you've missed. Um, so here we are, Ian Hamish. Big blessings. Welcome. Yes, bro. Thank you for, yeah. for joining us on this first show. Yeah, yeah thank you. Really appreciate you being here to tell us about your story and about your massive journey. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's kind of cool. I get to share the story with someone who is actually part of my journey. So that's the, that's a first for me. Um, oh, I didn't know about this. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we've been we've been friends for we've been friends for quite some while, quite some time now. We've been friends for about. 12 years, nearly 13 years, probably. Mm hmm Yep. Yeah, we crossed so, paths in Tenerife when I was uh, going through some things. Yes, Tenerife, beautiful place. One of our favorite it, places as well. It yeah. is, I love that smoke. <laughs> the next place is Phuket, Thailand. That's where you got to come next. Yeah, well, we'll get to Phuket in a bit, but... Let's start at the beginning. Let's okay. because this is the we reason want. we're here. We're here. <laughs> yeah, man, we're here to, to get people. We want people to know your story. Um, obviously, we've heard a little bit about you being in Tenerife, but um, you were originally from Colorado, uh, USA. Yeah. So how did you end up in Tenerife, man? Tell us your story. Uh, yeah, so I'll just go ahead and start from the beginning, you know. Um, Grew up in kind of a, a kind of small town in, in Parker, Colorado, just southeast of Denver. Um, super good athlete, athlete, just wrestled, played soccer, played football. Uh, you know, just a typical American lifestyle. Had a really good upbringing, but uh, was 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 riddled with addiction, man. Always had uh, issues with addiction in my dad's side of the family. And at a young age, I got prescribed Adderall and Xanax. Very young age, which to me is mind blowing. And um, it's just crazy to think a doctor, you know, would, would prescribe a, a 13, 14 year old kid, you know, narcotics like that in that degree. But anyways, uh, one state a few times in wrestling and, uh, sophomore year, um, going into junior year, I ended up having to go to rehab. I crashed my car, fell asleep behind the wheel, drinking Southern comfort and, and taking Xanax and doing cocaine. And I missed, uh, a tree by inches and a sign and I was right between both of them so that was kind of the first time uh God gave me a, a second chance uh by the time my senior year I got expelled from high school just a habitual offender man just kept going back to addiction and drugs and doing coke and um eventually uh got kicked out of school but I ended up going to senior nationals which is like the super bowl of wrestling at the end of your high school career if you're a state champ you get to go to this tournament and I ended up taking fourth. Uh, that got me a, a full ride scholarship to a college in Idaho. Went up there for a little bit and basically just blew that opportunity. You know, just drank all all the money they gave me. Um, didn't didn't go to class. Just went to wrestling and parties. And I was like, how is there time for class if I'm partying and wrestling all the time? And so that was another opportunity that I, I blew right away. Came back to Colorado. Um, parents just went through a big divorce, lost the house. Um, so I was basically at square one. It was 2008 in the depression. I had a few warrants uh, out for my name for like minor in possession, just, just little petty stuff. But um, I had a girl hit me up and she said, hey, uh, come, come to my prom in Canada. She lived in Vancouver. And we kind of dated in high school, but her family moved out to Vancouver. So I took the I took the plane trip out to Canada, thought it'd be a good like escape for me and ended up loving Vancouver, Canada, man. Um, got a full time job doing door to door sales. I was making like two to four grand a, a week, which is money for a 19 year old and that's for anyone. Money, man. Yeah, yeah man, right. That's a, that's a big money, man. Yeah. So everything was going really good. Well, I ended up meeting a 37 year old girl that I knocked on her door her friends opened the door she was crying in the corner and they said oh he's cute and pulled me in and uh ended up drinking with them and by the end of the night I was with them all day they were like you have to take her home she's too drunk to drive so I gave my contracts that I that I signed people up with because I was selling fixed rate contracts for natural gas and ended up driving this chick home well we were drinking some wine and apparently she wasn't answering her ex-husband's phone calls 
Um, so he showed up at the front door and I remember it was like a sliding glass door and she lived in a duplex at the top and he was like, I'm going to kill you, blah, blah, blah. And then he saw me and he was like, Hey, come outside, let's go. And I was like, you want me to come out there? And he was like, yeah. And so I just slid the door open just enough, boom, and just gave him one right to the nose <laughs> and just dropped him and, and jumped in full mount. And I was just giving him some slaps like, hey, buddy, go home. Your two kids are sleeping inside. I don't want to do this right here. And uh, then I remember, bro, he grabbed my nuts and like twisted, man. And, and I kind of like snapped and I, I held him over a two-story balcony where he was like, no. And the girl was like, uh, she also screamed no. And so I took him, I threw him like this and I grabbed him like bouncer style right here and by his jeans and rolled him down a flight of stairs. Um, so that was, um, I ended up moving in with this chick 10 days later. And <laughs> <laughs> You're out. I'm in. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I mean, it was pretty crazy. So everything was good. You know, we were one big happy family. I lived in the guest bedroom. And, oh, um, you, you know, the, the the kids that lived there and stuff, you know, they thought I was just a guest. And um, I ended up buying a car and I was making a good life for myself. But this dude was doing a bunch of research on, on me coming in the country and found that I was working there illegally. So he called immigration. About four months later, I had a, a, a pounding on that door again. It, it sounded like him, like he was ready for round two. So I, I rushed to the door in my underwear, opened the curtains, and uh, it was immigration. And so they took me in, locked me up. Uh, I remember I sat in jail from Thursday to Monday because there was a, a Sorry, holiday how, on Friday. How did that make you feel at the time, yeah, that, that, that you're, being, you're being taken away by immigration? Like you're an immigrant. Yeah, I mean, it was bad because I went home actually in that time, and I tried to come back to Canada, and they were like, "You have a DUI, you have open warrants, you're not allowed in the country." So I tried to walk across, and they almost set the dogs after me. And I'm posted up in a hotel on the other side of the border, and finally I called the girl who originally brought me out there, and um, her mom came and picked me up, and it was like, luckily they were just like. Yeah, he's just going to be here a week. Okay, go ahead. And they didn't check my name. But through the Greyhound and with me walking, it was sketchy. So I was on like this, like if I got caught there again, I was going to do some time trying to cross the border. And so, yeah, you know, it's it's tough. Like I, I understand. I feel for, for immigrants out there, you know, trying to make it in another country. It's definitely tough, especially when you've created a life for yourself and you get taken away from that life. You know, you feel betrayed by the country, you know. Yeah, um, so I sat in jail that whole week and I'm like freaking out, bro. I'm like coming off the Xanax and the Adderall and like, I make them take me to the hospital and like get more of it. And I mean, I'm just in a little cell, like, like six by eight and in a holding cells are the worst where they just slide the food under and it's four days there. And I remember it was when Brock Lesnar was going to fight, uh, Randy Couture. Cause I remember I was all jazzed to watch that fight. And, uh, so I missed that. I came out of jail. I, I I was taking the Xanax like crazy. I was doing lines of Coke. I was just out of control doing shots of tequila. Came home, was looking for my ecstasy. The girl told me that she had taken it with her husband's friend and had sex all weekend when I was gone because she heard I hooked up with the girl I originally went out there and she thought I would admit it. That was all the story, bro. Mad drama. So I put her on oh. the wall soprano style and I was like, did you do that? She was like, yes. And I punched two two holes in the wall next to her head. And I just trashed her place. Well, next morning, her kids were all freaked out. So I wake up and I just feel like just getting hit. Like she just full mounted me and was just like pounding on me. And I just remember I wanted whatever was happening to stop. And I like woke up with like on top of her holding her. And she was like, oh, you're crazy. And I was like, whoa, what is going on? And she called the cops and she sold wine, she sold wine for a living. So I grabbed like. Uh, one of her most expensive bottles of wine and just took off towards the beach and the cop car pulls out in front of me like that I roll over the hood the bottle breaks I went at the cop apparently with the bottle and man they beat my ass bro like <laughs> like they, they beat my ass like put me in the back of their little paddy wagon and like I remember just getting stomped like body shot after body shot like you ain't in America 
like you can't come to our country and do this. You're an immigrant. <laughs> yeah. So I sported a, I sported a swollen shut black eye. And the crazy part, right when I got to jail, they were like, uh, we want to question you. And I was like, let's go. And I'm still like drunk and uh, like feeling the Xanax from the night before. So they question me and I make up this crazy story, bro. Like, cause I didn't want to sell out my job cause they were paying me under the table. So I made, I made up this job. I was cage fighting there. I met this chick on the internet and, um, and I basically was like, I'm going to kill that dude who ratted me out. I'm going to sneak across the border again and find him and, and throw him in the ocean where no one can find him. So it made front page of the newspaper in the Vancouver sun. You can actually Google it. And I remember we went to so court it was again. A ser- so, so sorry. So it was really yeah. like, it, it was a really serious time at, at, at that moment in time, like things were getting, getting drastic. Did you think yeah. they were going to get worse or, or, or did you think that was kind of like it? Um, I, I didn't know. I, I knew I was probably done in Canada. I figured my, I figured you fight the police and you get arrested twice. You're probably not coming back. And, uh, you know, I was sad, man, because I had such a good job. I felt like I was like a functioning adult and it was cool because like, I bought my own car and, you know, things were working out. And. So we're in court again, and the first time they let me out, and it was the same judge. And I remember the lawyer was like, please don't say anything. And I'm like, I stand up, and I'm like, Your Honor, I would like to say something. And he was like, oh, my God. And I was like, bro, I was like, Your Honor, I'm so sorry. I'm not a dangerous person, but when I drink and do Xanax, I become belligerent, and I'm so sorry. Please let me out again. And she was like, Mr. Heinish, you are a threat to Canadian society. We will not let you out again. And basically they walked me off to jail. And I remember the Canadian girl was in the stands and she just said in her Canadian accent, Ian, I am so sorry. And uh, that was the end of Canada. So from Canada, where next? Was it in so, Tenerife? Yeah, was that when you went to Tenerife after Canada? Uh, not quite yet. So I go, ba- I, go ba- I go back to the States and... Um, I'm, I'm back to square one, you know, it's 2008, my parents split up, there's no more money. Um, it, it, we're kind of in the process of a recession. It's, it's hard to find a job. Well, I met some, Gua- some Guatemalans out there who had connections with the Mexican cartel and we were sending ecstasy back to America to a buddy and he was really profitable. So I met up with this dude and he's like, hey man, can you keep getting more? And so I called the Guatemalans and they were like, yeah. So they started shipping me 2,000 pills a week. It was coming in and we were just hitting the rave scene. It was when raves were really big. And, you know, I'd just give like 100 pills to like five different friends. I would go in there and I would just go to people, hey, man, you want some pills? And they'd be like, yeah. And I'd be like, that guy in the green shirt or that guy in the red shirt. And every now and then it was undercover and they would search me. And I was like, I was just kidding. I asked, I thought uh, you had some pills for me. And so we never got caught doing that. And um, eventually we were getting stuck at Western Union. We were Western Union so much money to Canada. They would freeze our accounts. They would rob our money. And so we had to figure out a solution. And they sent down a guy who had 100,000 pills. He was giving me about 10,000 a week. And then I would just give him the cash and he would drive it back to Canada. Well, um, this lasted for about eight, nine months. Good money, crazy times. Um, And we were... I was dating this chick and my buddy, my partner who was dating her friend. And it was kind of a weird situation, but she would always ask me like, Hey, can you give me a thousand pills? And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like we never told them that we sold, but you know, they weren't stupid girls. Like they knew we never had worked and we had money and drugs all the time. And so eventually I was like, all right, yeah, I'll get it for you, but you're going to drive. Cause in my mind, I was like, if, if one of us goes down, it's her. I sat behind her. And I knew if she got pulled over, I was going to push the pills under her seat. And um, so we went to Walmart and I'll never forget set up this Mexican sketchy cat got in the car and he was like kind of shaky and he didn't have enough money. I could tell. And so I was like, all right, pull out and let's go in the McDonald's drive through. And she pulls out and boom, boom, hit with these two big SUVs, uh, drug task force, dude jumped on the hood pistol. And I just remember it with a pistol to my temple looking at the Walmart sign. And I was like, oh my gosh, I just turned 20. I'm looking at four to six years in prison in America, which if 
if I was going to go to any prison, America is not on the top list. Like it's terrible here. And I know England's kind of the same way, South America, Asia, but like yeah. Europe has some, some really good, um, you know, I mean, not good, but it's better. But so anyways, I posted bail. I went to the, uh, the post office and they issued me a passport when I was on felony bail. And I was like, well, I went back to the house where I was keeping all the drugs and they literally, it was like the movies, like cut the mattress, like turn everything inside out, like everything. But there was one slipper that I put like three grand in and I owed someone that money. And I was like, boom, this is my ticket out. And so I took that three grand. I bought a ticket to Amsterdam from JFK and I bought a Greyhound ticket, um, which I don't know if you don't know what Greyhound is. It's like a big bus system in America. Yeah, my Route 66. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought yeah, you were going to talk about the dog there. I was getting a bit confused. <laughs> we know <laughs> about the Route 66. <laughs> Route 66, yeah. So I said goodbye to all my family. The police kicked in my dad's apartment door, arrested my partner. He didn't want to come with me. He, did, he didn't have the resources to come with me. And um, yeah, I hopped, I hopped on a Greyhound, said goodbye to my family in Indiana, then hopped the train from Indiana to New York and said goodbye to all my family there. And boom, JFK to Amsterdam with about 2,000 American dollars in my pocket. And I didn't know anyone. How did that feel then, obviously, traveling? So now you, 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 you're kind of a fugitive in a sense. You're posting bail, you're skipping bail. You, you, it's not like you're running around, you're leaving the country, so you're having to cross like, borders and things like this. How, how did that feel? Uh, you know, the only thing I can really say about it is the dreams I would have. Almost every night I'd have these dreams of just being chased. You know, like, and... And then I would like come to this point where I'd be at a cliff and I would like look down and there's a drop and the police are there. And I remember I'd always pick the, I would always jump. And when I would jump right before I'd hit the ground, I would wake up and like cold sweats. And like, so, I mean, I was kind of getting haunted in a way by that, but uh, I would just, in my mind, I just told myself I'm going to backpack Europe because I always wanted to. So I tried not to make like a big deal out of it. Like I'm a fugitive. I was just like, you know, my name's Ian Nitos and I changed my last name on Facebook and I was like, this is who I am now. And it was kind of a weird feeling because you could never get really close to anyone because you were worried about telling them what's going on. And then if you fell out with them, they could always use that against you. So I had to be a little bit careful. Um, that must I would be say, an awful position. Yeah. To have yeah, to be I mean, in as well. Yeah. Cause you're trying to make new friends, right? But you got to be careful with what you say and, your life kind of becomes a lie. You get really good at lying. And, uh, that was like a habit I actually had to break after prison um, to just kind of be honest and open with people. I always had like a trust issue with people just because I lived that life for so long. But I lasted about three or four months in Amsterdam, blew all my money, got arrested the first night in Amsterdam, actually. Um, <laughs> so I, I wasn't really learning my lesson. But luckily, the police in Amsterdam were mad chill, and they let me out because right when I landed. <laughs> I like Amsterdam, to be fair. We do like Amsterdam. I think we all do, especially when the police are mad chill. You know, one of them. So here you are now, 20 years of age, on the run from America, in Amsterdam, so a foreign country in Europe. Like, you've got no money. Like, what's the next move? Yeah, so I'm living in hostel to hostel, and I'm running out of money fast. Amsterdam's a pretty expensive uh, place, as you know. And so I call my cousin. He's got a best friend who um, actually moved to, Be to Bruges, Belgium. And so he said, go down there. The guy will let you stay with him for a few weeks, let you get back on your feet. And so I cruised down there. I, I hopped a bus, and I took it on down to Bruges, Belgium. And um, my buddy Kai, he, my cousin's buddy Kai, took me in, and and let me stay there. And I was like, all right, well, it's time to get a job. So I took my American resume, which by the way, had my wrestling credentials on there. And I, like, and I just went from business to business with my, with my uh, resume, as you guys would call a CV, maybe, right? Yeah, yeah CV, yeah. that's the same thing, resume. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. So I got my CV and I'm going from business to business. And finally I get to this Irish pub and the Irish guy's looking at my resume and he's laughing and he's like, all right, I'll hire you in the kitchen. And so I'm working in the kitchen, um, you know, making a decent living, you know, and he was like, hey, but uh, where's your work visa? And I was like, oh yeah, you know, it's in the mail. I was like, it'll be here any day. I'll, I'll bring it right in when I get it. 
And then like two months later, he was like, he was like, well, uh, where's your work visa, man? I never got that. I was like, oh, you know, the mail system out here, it's crazy. And he's like, well, you're a good worker. So if immigration comes, you just got to hide in this closet. And like, honestly, like, like not being racist at all, but I felt like a Mexican in Europe, like, like straight up. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, and I feel their pain, man. I, you know, I had to, I had to kind of be on the DL. So I'm working away in the kitchen in uh, this crazy English dude comes and he, he gets a job at the bar and this dude was living in Tenerife before and he met this girl from Belgium and they were going to get married. And so he moved back to Belgium with her, but this kid was wild. Like he's actually on like uh, a bunch of reality television shows now, which is funny. He's on like okay. below deck. Um, and he's on this reality television show where they have to smuggle themselves back into England from Europe. I don't know if you've seen it, but anyways, yeah, he's, he's, and I actually reunited with him at UFC London, which was kind of cool, but this That's kid fine. doesn't, he doesn't really have family and stuff. And he was just wild, you know? And so we were about to shut down the bar and, you know, I closed the kitchen down. I came downstairs. We were getting ready to shut the bar. Well, about 20 chicks came in to a big hen party and we were like, yeah, we were like, come on in. And next thing you know, bro, we're dancing on the bar. We're drinking bottles behind the bar. And like, this is in Tenerife up... now. Are we in Amsterdam? Where, where hey, am I now what? in the story? Where are you? I'm getting where lost. You? Like, I'm I can gonna... see you. You're just going, you keep looking at yourself. How am I looking? Am I looking <laughs> fine? <laughs> with, I'm with, going down as well. I don't know how. You know, I'm terrible with tech. <laughs> yeah, but we're still right. in Bruges. We're, Bruges we're not in Tenerife yet. We're soon there, though. Don't worry. We're getting there slowly. Yeah, yeah, we're I'm almost there. Up. I'm like, Nelly, on the phone. Sorry, guys. We'll have to with this, remember? Oh, all right. All right. I'm sure everyone's having a good, good, uh, good watch. Yeah. I don't all know right. who's been watching the comments, but I just think the parents and raising and mental life and like just all of it. I, I don't, I've got so many questions for you as well, but I'm going to, Max, do you want to go first? <laughs> all right all right let's focus okay we're in belgium yeah. and Bruges, okay yeah. we're in belgium let's go from belgium <laughs> and, and shoot whatever questions you want <laughs> kaylee whenever you I have a question nervous. let me know okay right um, okay so but i wanted to ask you like some obviously like questions about like um like how the laws have changed over in the u.s now and how which kind of changed around for well, with the legalization, because obviously it was like illegal and everybody did frown upon it, and now it's being made like that it is medical and it can't help you and everything else. And um, so, what do you think it's happened over there with uh, the legalization of weed <laughs> over here? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know if you get what I mean. <laughs> no, I mean, when I got when, <laughs> when I got back from uh, from Europe after all the craziness happened. Yeah, I came back and when I left, it was only like medical card. And then now it's like recreational as well. So yeah, I definitely seen a big change. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's helping a lot of people, you know, a lot of people moved to Colorado. Our, our state now is so like, full. It's like New York traffic, California traffic, because so many people moved here when the marijuana was legal here. We were the first state, one of the first states to be legalized. And so it's just brought in, it's, it's boost the economy and it's just brought in a lot of people, but it's almost too crowded for me now. <laughs> so yeah. I think it's, it's, well, the thing is Colorado is, is quite, um, it's not really, uh, how can I say, rural. It's, it's quite open space. There's a lot of uh, contraland to it. A lot of um, um, mountains and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Whereas... Yeah. We're right so next I, to the mountains. I, so I yeah. would, I would, I would assume that a lot of that land has been has been brought for the the, the growing of of mm -hmm. of the cannabis, uh, and a yep. lot of people who weren't there before have purchased land specifically just to grow. So I can imagine for yourself, you know, growing up and having, you know, a lot of open space now to be kind of restricted on where you can go because of the amount of space that's being taken up like yeah how, 
that that must be you know frustrating. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's because we're Denver's like a town, right? It's a big city right next to the mountains. Like we got the Rocky Mountains just butt right up to our city, and um, and yeah, it's it's yeah. It, it used to be really chill, cheap to live, um, not traffic, and now it's really like so much traffic. Like that's why I'm I'm planning on moving after this fight to kind of get back to nature. Okay. And, Yep. Sorry, let's stop. Let's go back because we don't want to talk about the fight yet. We need to go f continue your story. So okay. we're, in, okay. we're moving through Bruges. Bruges? Okay, we're moving yeah, yeah, Bruges. Bruges. Where from Bruges? Okay, so we, we, we get fired from our jobs. The, the boss watches the tape the next day. He can't believe it. He prints out my little Canadian uh, charges on the newspaper and he's like, you're a criminal and I'm not gonna pay you. So me and dude, the English guy, Kyle, we grabbed this dude by his arm, we walk him to the cash register, we're like, just pay us and you'll never see us again. So he pulls the cash out, he pays us, and uh, uh, Kyle tells me, he says, I'll get his jobs, mate, let's go to England. So I was like, okay. So we hopped on a ferry from Bruges, I think to Leeds, I think it was to Leeds, and, and his idea of a job, we were in some little town, bro, by Sheffield, and we were in this apartment with no hot water, uh, no furniture, no electricity. And we literally camped in this apartment and painted it in the day. And I was like, bro, I cannot, we can't, I can't live like this, bro. And he's like, all right, don't worry. So we hit the town of Sheffield and we ended up getting a job at some bar or club PRing. And um, a few weeks into this job, this guy had an idea to like rob the safe or something. And I was like, bro, I want no part of this. And he got like, uh, he got kicked out. He got fired. I got brought into the office. I was like, look, I barely know this guy. We just met like a month ago. And he's like, all right, well, you're a good worker. So we're going to keep you. So then I moved into student housing and I was living in uh, England for about four to five months. And it was, it was like during the winter, man. So it, I never saw the sun ever. And it was just, we it don't was wearing it in, the sun, in the summer, either, so don't worry about it. <laughs> Bro. So I was like, I was to the point where I was like, you know, I want to go to a place where they speak English, obviously, but I can't, I can't live in England anymore. So everyone was like, go to, go to uh, Tenerife. You know, that's where there's so many English there. It's beautiful year round. And so I started, I got a sh few shipment of pills over to England and I was trying to sell them at the club, which was a terrible idea because no offense the English like to do like cheap, dirty drugs. And they like, won't pay for quality. And we almost got in fights with like, I don't know if it offends people, call them chavs, like everywhere, bro. Like they would, <laughs> I'm telling you, I gave, I gave this dude four pills, bro. And he swallowed all of them. And I was like, dude, these aren't like the ones you have. And he's like, oh, and 10 minutes later, he's in my face. You sold me fake shit. You yank, you yank. And he's like in my face, bro. So I like ducked and dodged him. Then I gave him two more and he ate it. And like, next thing you know, he's on the couch, just like, oh my gosh and I rolled up on him and I was like bro what did you say about fake pills and he's like I love you man and I was like wham and I just gave him a slap bro but he looked like he liked it it was kind of weird um, so I just I just unloaded it uh what I had to some some Pakistani fellas and I hopped the plane from England to Tenerife and it was paradise bro and I uh, I was walking along the beach in Los Cristianos. I walked all the way to Las Americas and I drank like a 12 pack along the way. And I was like, I love it here. It looked like American beautiful girls, like, but they were speaking Spanish. And it was just like, I rolled up to Las Veronicas and I was like, I'm looking for a job. And they're like, you're hired. And basically, as you know, they basically pay you in drinks at Las Veronicas. You get like eight drinks when you work. <laughs> Four drinks when you get off, a pound or a, a euro a head, you personally bring in. So, I mean, three months of this, I'm a full-blown alcoholic. Like, I can't even pay my 30 euro a month rent. Like, I'm sleeping on people's couches. Like, I'm basically homeless at this point. Sometimes I'm just sleeping on the beach. Like, if it was windy, I remember, like, digging a hole and just, like, sleeping on the beach. Like, it was bad. And I met this American who came up to me, and he's like, bro, you got potential. Like, gringo, we don't want to see you live like this. So, he's like, come stay with me. And uh, they took me in like family, and they still are like family. That's, that's was, Alex, man. Yeah, that's Alex. Yeah, and that's uh, the bro, Steve, man. 
Yeah, it is the broski. And so Alex took me in and uh, we'll call his dad Jim. And uh, one day they sat me down and Jim took me to the balcony and he said, hey, gringo, let's make some real money. And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, Columbia, gringo, Columbia. And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay, let's go. So next thing you know, we're flying down to Colombia, Venezuela, uh, Aruba, and we're buying a kilo of Coke. We're wrapping it up, swallowing it, bringing it back. And um, I would say about three trips in, I get pulled in the Bogota airport. Some just uh, some black guy comes up to me in street clothes, and he was like, "Dami su pasaporte," and I was like, uh, "No comprende, sir." And he was like, "Secret police," and I was like, "Oh." And I gave him my passport. He's like, "Oh, you like to come to Colombia, huh?" And I was like, yeah, you know, I have a girlfriend here, you know, no big deal. It's awesome here, the beach, you know? And he was like, oh, okay, sit down. And so he sits me down next to these like beautiful Colombian girl and like two sketchy looking dudes. And I'm like, I lean over and I'm like, what are we doing here? And they're like, the x-ray. And I was like, oh my God. And so I knew the Colombians told me that- So hold on, let's get this straight. You're sitting, waiting to go for an x-ray and you're loaded up with a kilo with cocaine, with a kilo of coke sitting inside you. Yep. Ah. <laughs> Talk about also twitching. Like, you must have been clapping it at this minute. Oh, bro. And, like, luckily I was pretty drunk. So, like, that was the only thing keeping me, like, composed. Because, like, I was, like, thinking in my head, I was, like, four to six years, Colombian prison. I was, like, bro, that is bad. I was like, I'd rather be in American prison. I was like, so they walked me, but the luck of the Columbians told me there's a special paper on it that passes the x-ray. But I didn't know if that was just to make me feel better. So they take me to this room, Bogota airport, capital of Columbia, put me in this big room. There's a big x-ray machine and I'm on this thing and they're like, put your hands up. And it's like, and it's kind of like a treadmill. And then they walk, I walk out and he goes, Tiene buen día, Senor Heinish. And I was like, have a good day, sir. And I fingerprinted and signed. And bro, that that was that was a feeling that could compare to winning a big fight. Like, I mean, the adrenaline rush that I had walking out, I was like, oh, oh my. Like I was like, so oh, I was it's like, gone cool. from it's gone from sitting there thinking, oh my God, I'm sitting there with with, with all of this inside of me, like what the hell in this machine which probably looked like something out of star trek do you know what i mean like yeah so you're automatically thinking like listen this is picking up everything inside i'm not walking out of here and yeah. then you've heard boom 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 there you go have mate. a good day you're like, ah, yeah what what yeah. the fuck like you must have felt you untouchable <laughs> you felt untouchable you must have so so we fly back to tenerife and exactly like you said bro confidence is through the roof we i'm like what are they going to do x-ray us we used to wait three months before we would go take another trip but now we're kind of getting sloppy like two three weeks saying hey let's go let's book another one boom go down there get and put an x-ray again in venezuela pass and i was like i'm untouchable like what are they going to do just keep x-raying the problem was is the passports were getting stamped over and over and over and i wanted to go get a new passport like say i lost it go to the american embassy but I knew stepping foot on, on American soil, which is the American embassy, they could be like, oh, boom, arrest me right there and extradite me back to the States because of the felony. So I never did it. And we took this trip to Aruba and everything kind of went wrong that trip. Like we were supposed to get the merchandise within a month. We had to extend it two months because we couldn't find it. And then after we found it, um, we, instead of flying to the mainland, Spain, and then to Tenerife, we flew Caracas, Venezuela, and then directly to Tenerife. So I landed Tenerife. The, the guy uh, that I was with goes in front of me, and because we act like we don't know each other, they pull me in the office, which they've done before, and they said, what are you doing here? And I'm like, oh, my girlfriend lives here. I'm this rich American. Like, my family's loaded. But the thing was... I didn't have any credit cards. I just had a wad of cash, like 5,000. And they were like, well, what happens when your cash runs out? And I was like, oh, my family, Western Union's me. And they're like, that, that doesn't seem right. My girlfriend came around, verified it. They let me go, but they followed us down to the parking garage without us knowing. And the other guy was waiting there for us. And as we met, boom, they jumped on us. 
And, um, and instead of taking us to a normal x-ray that is usually in the airport, because Tenerife is kind of like Africa, um, they didn't have that equipment in the airport. So they took us to the hospital and it was like the legit x-ray where they're like, leave the room and they're like, don't move, sir. And I like move when they leave. They're like, no, no vale. They finally laid me down on this bed and got the x-ray and they brought me in and this beautiful Spanish doctor was like, you have balls of drugs in your intestine. What is it? What is it? And I like couldn't really see it. And it was just a little, you could just barely see it. And I was like, no. And she's like, it's seguro. She kept telling me it's seguro. And I was like, which means it's for sure. It's for sure. And I was like, no. And she's like this. And she kept circling this part on there. And I was like, I ate some Chinese food. And then they just like laughed and boom, handcuffs on. Um, and took my girl that was we were with to jail. I sat in jail for about three days. I sat in prison for one year with no court hearing, no date, no nothing. So the whole time we were telling ourselves every day, man, they're going to let us out. Like it's fake. It's fake stuff. Maybe they're just going to let us out. So that was kind of the hope we had to get. But luckily in this, in this uh, Tenerife prison, they, uh, they had things for us. Like I, I joined the wrestling team called Lucha Canaria. I, was able to do kickboxing and the K1 Spanish champ was locked up with me who we fought and trained all the time together. Um, I got to learn Spanish fluent. Um, I, I, I found a, a great relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, and I was, you know, actually reforming myself and it was probably at the time, the worst thing that could happen to me. But now looking back, it was the best thing that could have ever happened. to me. So you ended up in jail in Tenerife you've managed to get your mind into things that, you know, that, that, that you were interested in, 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 in the past, you know, the wrestling, I know that you said you was a state championship wrestler. So being back in this position, you know what I mean? Being able to do some things that you used to do before also finding finding faith in the most high. Now you're, you're, a little bit stronger minded, you clear of all the drugs and the alcohol. Yes. Yeah. Where next? So you've gone, you tell me you're out of prison and everything now. How did you end up in the UFC from there? Yeah. So, well, after about a year and a half, what's that? Um, I was just had a little play in my phone that was only about 10 minutes and it was like, go. I can't okay, really yeah, hear we've you. Got, we've got 10 minutes left. Oh, okay. Just in case. All right, I'll just, I'll speed it up then. So um, we, I eventually got uh, Con Air to the north of Spain. They didn't like that I was doing really good at their wrestling program. I literally was out without contacts for like three months. They took me away from everyone I knew. It was just a lot of mental games. The, the Spanish prison was like, you're going to get out, then you're not, then you're going to get out. Eventually, I got a three and a half year sentence. I got it cut by uh, three fourths or one fourth of my sentence cut off. Uh, promising that I would never come back to the EU or the UK for five years. And so they extra, they expelled me back to the States. And that's why it was so hard to be able to get me on that UFC London, but we eventually pulled that off. But I ended up going to London and then they, the fighter pulled out the day of the fight, um, which that's was crazy. That's it, that's it, and a whole nother story. story. So I'm on a plane. I'm free for the first time in two years and four months. I land in New York. JFK airport and I'm figuring I'm going right back to prison because I just ran from felonies and I was hoping there was like a statue of limitation you know we talked about that a lot <laughs> hopefully yeah. I can just stay away from the states for seven years and then go back and be cool but uh yeah so I, the, I remember the lady at the passport she was like how long have you been out the country sir and I was like uh five years and she was like come with me and they ended up, they threw me in Rikers Island, which is one of the worst prisons in America. Um, somehow I survived two months in there. They put me in maximum security because I was a felon, a fugitive. And um, I ended up getting in an altercation with these guys on, with, with this gang on the last few days I was there. And they had an SOS on me, which means stab on sight. And their plan was literally to get me the next day. And I called the guard and I was like, guard, please get me out of here. These guys want to kill me. I didn't, because... The lawyer wanted me to go to protect custody in the beginning, but I said, I ain't going to punk city. Like throw me with the wolves. I'll lead the pack. That's the mentality I had, but I didn't realize how bad it was. But the guard said, F you white boy and slammed the door on me. 
And I'll never forget that I stayed up all night making weapons. They were getting, I mean, the, the guards and the inmates were connected. Like they would come in and be like, what up, blood? What up? Like they were in the same gang on the streets. So um, there was really no protection there. And literally an hour before the doors opened, two big football player looking guys came. It was the U.S. Marshal. They looked like angels. It was by the grace of God, I was saved. I was taken back, extradited back to the States, got released 2014 Valentine's Day, basically turned my body into a weapon. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie uh, The Hurricane by Reuben Carter, the boxer. It's Denzel Washington. Yeah. Watch that Denzel movie. Yeah, yeah. Buddy. That movie's legit. Um, and that's kind of where I got my nickname. He came out and became a world champ, and that's what I'm going to do. Um, you know, it took me um, about it took me about four years to get in the UFC after that, and now I'm top ten in the world. So, And you know what? We've just been told now we've only got a few minutes left, and we've only just tapped on the UFC up. If possible, I'd like to catch up with you again. Um, yeah. Maybe after the yeah. UFC 250, um, okay. and catch up with the interview and see how, obviously, your fight went at UFC 250, if, if that's good with you. Yeah, no. Yeah, it's, it's great, man. Um, I definitely want to tell you more about when I got released because it wasn't just a straight path to the top. I made it to the top 10. I've lost the past two. I'm ranked 13th right now. But uh, I'm fighting June 6th um, at UFC 250. So I plan on get. I lost some close decisions in the past, and I plan on getting those back and showing a new me. So I'm excited. Good shit. Okay, so for the last um, the last few minutes, we've got our quick fire round, which is um, basically we're going to ask you 15 questions in 30 seconds. It's just two answers. So you can okay. either give one or the other, yeah? Okay, Okay. let's go. All right, so Chip, are we ready um, with the timer? Have we got our timer ready? We're just waiting to hear from our tech team. Have we got the clock up? Are you ready for this? Yes, we I'm ready. ready. For this? Let's get it. Just waiting for the tech team to give us confirmation. Let's go, champ. Let's go, <laughs> champ. Okay, okay. <laughs> right. Okay, 15 seconds. Sorry, 30 seconds. Start. Okay, we're going to try this on three, yeah? One, two, three. Home cooking or takeaway? Home cooking. Pepsi or Coke? Coke. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Weed or alcohol? Weed. Bath or shower? Shower. Joint or bung? <laughs> Joint. Blonde or brunette? What? Blonde or brunette? Uh, blonde. <laughs> Love or money? Love. Ferrari or Lamborghini? Ferrari. Obama or Trump? Trump. <laughs> BJJ or wrestling? Wrestling. Breast or bum? What? Breast or bum? Oh, oh, Breast or bum? Bum. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> vaccination or no vaccination? No. No needles. No needles. No needles. Are you a giver or a taker? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Listen, Ian, thank you very much, man. It's been mm. an absolute pleasure. Can't wait to catch up with you again soon. Okay. Pass you over to Kaylee quickly. She's right, going to say her thank yous and she's going to do our introducing the track of the week. Once again, Ian, thank you very much. Thank you, bro. Good to see you, man. Yeah, man. Kaylee. Kaylee. It's over to you. You've got the introduction to do. We're going to get a bit of like, the story as well. It's yeah, frozen now. Okay. We're All going right, to catch Kaylee. up with Ian again. Next week, we're going to be catching up with Nat G from Geordie Shaw. So make sure you're locking there. Are you going to introduce the track of the week? Yeah, we have K2, Dylan, um, and Rock Rain. Sorry. 
Rummy boy, come on. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Rummy boy is a song that I've been listening to all day. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm... Also, big shouts going out to Fresh Wave Media for making this happen. Shouts out to the Dank yeah. Moves, Loudest Entertainment, everybody that's locked in and tuned in. It's been an absolute pleasure. Stay with us and we're going to make this bang. Please. Thank you, guys. God yeah. bless. Stay safe. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> Three hammers in the garden cell, okay. one cost could be told in one. But well, you know about going to a funeral, shoot, like, he's still gone. Oh. Albanian link, keep ringing my phone because he knows I'm certain. That's two boxes in the yeah, morning, then the next two, three, thirty. Beating the fuck out of the red on my lease, doing up numbers. Doing up compass, licking up trappers and punters. Used to be counting hundreds, now we sold grams and a thousand grams. I was broke as fuck, now the jacket on me, two thousand grand. Rapper, trapper, live in the flesh, come get you a pick. I got TT coming in raw, I got my young G smashing in drawers. Got certain any time and talk I got the board dog out for a walk Why you know about fucking up the food Cause you press too much Cause you try and make more I'll be in a trap I should be in studio Fucking these tracks 22 and I'm nice I just lost five But I make that tonight I fuck up the roads I swear for the city You know how it goes I got a baddie She with me Nails on fleet She looking like gold Work it Tell me baby Is it worth it Keep it real Then you can earn it Then anything you want I purchase You get that Gucci Gucci Put these diamonds On your Gucci She love my life like a movie, steak and lobster eating bougie. Two bricks and a two bricks and a car got a high vis jacket and I'm wearing glasses. Used to do drawers in baggies, now I drop a 36 by the baggage. Flavors plug in packets, man, I'm serving them no rackets. Find one spot, then slap it. Put deals on, then get cracking. Me and Ray went hard back then, trapping from market schools. Jay putting work in uni, coming for a box or more. Age just on one lick, so we got a cheap price on four. Mally just come through nice with a link on a brand new tool. Still link with it. Still link with the EB Dunzo WUV size. Then I go back by Bromtar, so fly down to receive size. Smashing out singles and bigs while my young G smashing out free fights. My white boy pull up on West, JD bag on the pit bike. What you know about being consistent? Tell my girl that I need some distance. First time that I can't erect her. It was funny because my palms was itching. What you know about teams in the kitchen? Whipping, whipping. Pneumonia all in the air. Corona can't scare me, we die in the air. <coughs> Brummy, come from the bits that are bummy. Look, it's a summy for money. And I need a belly, not Tommy. I drop a bag on my mommy. She need anything, she can get it all from me. I turn a human a zombie. I want a Rafe and a Rari. I want a baddie like Cardi. I just spent one in the party. She just got gas off my car. Baby, welcome to the. <laughs> one minute. Yeah. Yeah. One minute. <laughs> you know how the fuck is, isn't it? Two.